Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Wild Rift Esports podcast. This is the first episode today, of course. I say of course, as if we've established some sort of uh, pedigree. I'm joined by Excoundrel and Dooms. Excoundrel, resident 2v2 content creator champion, I believe. Yeah, what can uh, I my- say? <laughs> Hard gaps, dark breaker and Stuart's day. Uh, wasn't even close, by the way. Uh, and Stu got very salty about it, so... Uh... <laughs> that does sound like something that Stuart would do. I believe he is known for being particularly salty. Oh, bless him. Nah, it was good fun. I enjoyed it. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to the uh, the Horizon Cup tomorrow. I'll be starting the casting, so I'll be doing the uh, first two games. I didn't know you did casting, considering you were no, such an, exactly. an impressive player today. I thought you were some sort of professional. I didn't... Isn't well, Stu like? I thought he plays auto rank, doesn't he? I thought. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was thinking about taking and uh, and sort of putting the cast into the side and becoming a pro player. Uh, yeah. I've, I've gapped two of the best players in Europe, so you know who who's, who's who can stop me. Uh, yeah, no, Darkbreaker, multi-time challenger, I believe. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah it's well, crazy. Uh, Darkbreaker, it's got nothing on me. Got nothing on my uh, on my Gragas to into the tower at level three. Anyway, yeah, going to be casting tomorrow. Looking forward to it. Yeah, of course, we're also joined by Dooms. The infamous mastermind behind the, the Game Lord era, ex Game Lord now, I believe, as of recent events. But uh, you know, feel free, give us give us a little bit of a rundown. Very long era indeed. Uh, clutching when we have, when we don't have to, and failing when we have to. But whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we'll we'll do better with the next teams. Hoping. Don't worry, I, I know a lot about failing when I have to not fail. I'm very very talented at that. They call me the second place king. <laughs> so yeah. Gapped by Ruiz, mate. That's uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's good. I'm excited for this, and I'm really excited for Horizon Cup this weekend. Um, you know, I think there's a little bit a lot of hype around it. I think it's going to be one of the first times we get to see all the different regions come together. And this is where we actually can be BM each other on Twitter. You know, all the BM that happened into regionally before is all is all a bit of you know nonsense realistically because mm. this is where we can really set the stakes. Although what's really sad is given the way the groups panned out, we actually probably well, unless EU and a, NA qualifier, we probably won't see EU versus NA. <laughs> that's, the, that's the really sad thing about the way the Horizon Cup's up. We might not actually get EU versus NA, which sucks, but there you go. No, I think, uh, you know, it's totally possible. I mean, you're right. It might be difficult considering obviously both EU and NA are going to come first in their respective groups, which means they won't meet until the finals. But I mean, you know, I'm sure stranger things have happened. And anyway, even if it doesn't happen, we can still keep fighting with Iraqi Zaro until 2022. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. True, 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 true. So yeah, uh, this is, uh, you know, the, the Wild of Esports podcast. It's a working title, as you can clearly see established by the brackets that state working title. I don't know what you guys expected, as if we have any any semblance of creativity uh, within this trio. Um, yeah, so the, the aim, obviously, is... Uh, Esports generated discussion, um, focusing on you know any any upcoming events stuff for like this. I don't know if we have much plans with regards to an actual physical schedule currently, but at least for right now, the first international uh, event for Wild Rift is coming up, and uh, we're all pretty excited about it. So I think we wanted to just kind of meet up, have a talk about it, give some uh, some I guess behind the scenes slash more professional oriented. Uh, thoughts and feedback and then kind of uh, you know pitch our projections for the event and kind of how we feel about it uh so yeah i guess that's what we're kind of aiming for um that's a rundown of what this is meant to be we'll, we'll see where it goes i'm sure the banter will begin to flow <laughs> within Absolutely. within no time at all feeling it already it's in the air here it's in the air the banter it's just uh i, and I think realistically we're, we're mostly gearing up for horizon cup right we we're all three of us pretty excited about to see what happens over the course of the next few weeks um it's going to be a good litmus test i'm hearing rumblings that it's probably going to go as expected but we'll we'll get to that i think uh i think you know we'll, we'll talk about the the, the, re- the strength of the regions we'll talk about the what we've heard from scrim results and maybe what we're expecting in terms of uh in terms of overall gameplay but i think it's probably worth starting off with like the first few games tomorrow's going to be a really good day for like getting grips with where each of the regions are and we've got like I'm covering DKG versus SBTC and then Ebro Gaming versus Team Queso. And then later on we're gonna have Team Secret versus TT, which is like insane game as well. And then we're gonna have TSM versus Tribe. So we're gonna see EU and NA play tomorrow, but we're also gonna see two of the biggest Southeast Asian teams take on the biggest Chinese teams, which is gonna be pretty insane too. The the I don't know how you guys feel, Dooms. I'll 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 probably get your get you input here first. 
most people expecting Southeast Asia and China to dominate here. So those are like the two regions that I think, given scrim results from what we've heard, and also just what we know from those regions in terms of mobile gaming, they're kind of the two regions that we expect to be the strongest, right? Yeah, like I'm really expecting China to beat everyone just as most all the people here for sure, because they've got like most, maybe not the most time since they didn't have the, uh, the game uh, instantly, but they were able to practice in SEA, but they also got the most investments in the region, like they're able to play literally from 7 a.m. until midnight if needed with uh, four coaches and 10 analysts per team, it's crazy. So yeah, I'm, I'm expecting them to really roll over everyone. At least I hope so, otherwise we're gonna do it for them. And uh, as, yeah, I don't know, like I feel like people are really, really hyped about them, even like more than for China. So I would maybe wish for them to lose a bit earlier than scheduled so it would uh, balance the other regions together. And yeah, I mean, it'd it definitely be nice, I was going to say, it'd be definitely nice if China wasn't just an extreme powerhouse coming into, like, you know, quote-unquote day one of competitive. It'd be, it'd be a bit of a shame if, uh, yeah, they just come in and smash everybody. But I'm not saying it's not possible. I mean, you know, I, having watched a lot of the Chinese games myself, I watched a lot of... Uh, I watched that entire Thunder Talk OMG series and that whole OMG run in general. I mean, Thunder Talk taking that final was absolutely insane. Um, I remember, I, I think I was watching it with Elegy. Uh, you because know, it was during Origin series, so we were actually, you know, at LAN, kind of watching the, um, like, the run-up to it, and then to just to see them just come into the final and just smash everybody, you know, me and Elegy were constantly talking about how cracked OMG were, and, like, Korn with these insane roams, and, like, uh, doing these crazy, uh, like, he would always, like, sack waves just to, like, dive bot, and as a mid laner, you know, that's insanity, because, you know, imagine giving up CS to, like, for, like, potential value to, like, your duo lane, like, I mean, you know, who could even trust them to carry? Um, so it was kind of crazy just to see he had this, like, really cool, unique, aggressive playstyle. And then they just got completely smashed by Z playing Fiora, so... <laughs> 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 it was kind of was, a shame, um, to be honest. I was watching, um... <laughs> it was, we were doing, like, rehearsals for Horizon, Horizon Cup today, and they had some footage of uh dk versus tt on the screen and huiba was just like stomping tt in the scrim like we like that guy i think is like individually pretty cracked and i know you guys have talked a little bit about china maybe not being as strong as southeast asia coming this but i actually think china might even be stronger i think because they've got so much pedigree from honor of kings and that that exact mobile control system is is panned over to wild rift I think that that those years of pedigree from Honor of Kings, it doesn't take much to translate that over to to like to Wild Rift, I think. And I think I think I think Dakuna like my my like my team to potentially take the mm. whole thing. I think that, but I think SBTC are also the strongest SEA team, clearly because they won the region, but also I just think in general they're the they're the strongest SEA team. So that first game, that first series, it's gonna be a crazy litmus test for between China and 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 Southeast Asia. And I think the outcome of that that game will set the tone for which the strongest region might be going into uh, the rest of the Horizon Cup, I think. Yeah, I wouldn't uh, forget, like, uh, this first series will be insane for sure. I think Team Secret haven't shown everything to, because if I'm correct, uh, during their SEA Championship, they weren't even a single time uh, all together in a, mm. in a house, whatever. So maybe the land effect of being together, I guess they are, for the Horizon Cup uh, can have a quite good effect on them so i'm really looking forward to see that because yeah they've been re really playing extremely well together for a team that hasn't even met even once like it's crazy yeah but i think definitely from my experience i find that you improve a lot faster as a uh, and i'm sure you know dooms can test to this excalibur can test to this like when you're together in a room as a team you improve so much faster comparatively compared to like when you're online and it's harder to like review and kind of get everybody on the same page and watching different stuff it's much easier when you're actually a, a unit together to kind of like accelerate your progress but yeah i do think day one yeah like you say i mean i think even the first series this could be the final right Realistically, yeah, yeah. this this could be the final, you know, and it's just like a taster of what's to come. Um, and I guess you could say that by any series that happens in the next, you know, five days, whether or not they're more likely to be a final is uh, <laughs> is probably more debatable. Um, but yeah, I do agree. I think Secret Thunder Talk as well is is probably something to watch. Thunder Talk in general, I mean, yeah, I did just talk about their great final against OMG, but obviously this team is now completely different. Um, if, if you aren't familiar with the, the situation, they actually had visa issues as a team. So they have uh, three new players coming in, and I believe they're all rookies. None of them have 
any actual competitive game so far. I could be, you know, mistaken about that. But also, the two rotating players, Z, who I did mention, was very, you know, good on his Fiora, was smashing OMG in that final, has now roll swapped back to mid, which is where he originally came from to make space for Feibai, who has now roll swapped to ADC. So not only do they have three, three subs, they now have two roll swaps as well, and... <laughs> I feel like it's much harder to predict them as a tournament favorite in that kind of condition. Um, but supposedly they are still doing really well. You know, again, you know, it's scrim talks here, scrim talks there. From what I've heard, TT is still very strong. But yeah, I think Darken have kind of stepped into that favorite to win kind of role. As you mentioned, like Weber and, and in general, that whole roster. Uh, this is the one with wind, right? I don't want to like. Yeah, the, but yeah, the, I don't want to. I don't want to get the wrong the wrong players but i believe yeah wind is pretty good as well from what i understand that roster is built around huiba like he's kind <laughs> of like the the star player on dakun and then obviously the whole roster is really good but i think when you watch him play i think when you get a chance to watch him play you'll kind of see what we mean but he is cracked like that that guy i, <laughs> I was watching him play akali and I, i'm like i've never seen anyone play akali like he was in this scrim like he just absolutely was turbo shitting <laughs> on like every team fight it was it was pretty crazy i mean uh, i'm i'm just really excited to see those guys in competitive as well though because i think you're going to get a real clash of like regional metas because I, I think when we, we, have that, we have that second game we have ebro gaming versus team queso i think when i was talking to a lot of the other analysts who had looked at team queso from the origin series a lot of them said they'd adapted other region meta and we just hadn't caught up at the origin series right so like they came in and they were like level one waving like their top laner they were duo you know duo level one mm. laning mid and then they were rotating acolyte top especially versus leon they'd rotate acolyte top who'd get level two early and then leon just wouldn't be able to find the advantage in lane right and i i think that we just were like as a region we were slow to adopt some of these other styles seen in other regions Maybe not the quad mid <laughs> that we were seeing from some of the regions, but like this duo mid strategy, clearly, if you had a weak topsider, which I think if you look at Acolyte, he's good, but like he, he probably isn't like the star player, right? Andre is probably the star player of the Team K roster, Team Jason, case the roster as a general, but like they were very, they knew that Acolyte was going to have a bad time versus a very carry orientated, very high mechanical skilled player like Leon. And so they would just try and do everything they could to like negate that matchup. And by level one laning, Darius mid getting early level two it just meant that leon was constantly on the back foot from the very get-go in that lane right uh, and i think we were just we were we were slow to adapt to that as a region whereas team queso borrowed that very early on and kind of got away with it and i think the problem is that when you take that style back to the other regions who have been doing it better for ages that might be the problem for team queso and i think that's been one of the problems that i've heard from skin wise that it just it's just not working out for them the same way that it did in europe right yeah, like TQ, if there's one thing like uh, they've really proven during the Origin series, it's their ability to adapt. Like even if they lose against Ebro, a lot of people might say, okay, uh, Europe is screwed for sure. Uh, I wouldn't think so because like, I can't say that. I was the one who had to choose who we would face in the Origin series on the second day. I had to choose between Rix or Team Queso. I was the one choosing Team Queso and losing the next day, so <laughs> I regret it for sure. <laughs> But um, yeah, they've proven they can adapt very fast. And there are two things that really impressed me. One, as you said, is really their adaptation to auto metas really fast. And also they're really knowing their limits. So as you say, like, okay, they might not have maybe the most mechanical players, but their ability to say, okay, we're not going to aim for the 100% perfect mechanical play. We're going to aim for a composition and something that requires maybe a bit less mechanical skill, but that requires synergy, that requires movements together as a team. Their ability to synergize S5 is purely insane. Like, it's, I guess, the only team who didn't do a single roster swap since January or something like that. And they're really proving why and why it's working. So it's really impressive. And yeah, even if they lose against Ebro, it would be a hard stunt and they might not get out of the groups because of it. But I do think they can still bounce back and show us amazing things against Team Secret in their next match, for example. Uh, that's for sure. Yeah, I think that's a great point about Team Queso. Like the, I think Ruiz was the last roster change from when he was on uh, Trovo Nova. Like, the original Trovo Nova, it was like Vex, Ruiz, uh, Grizzly Q, now on UL, uh, Poseidon, and Darkbreaker, actually. Uh, Darkbreaker slash Clamaras was, was the, uh, the Baron laner. And yeah, he ended up leaving to join, join Team Queso because he wanted to be on that Spanish roster. 
Spanish speaking, I believe. I mean, I, I, it's hard to tell because I know memorized isn't Spanish and I don't know how much Spanish he speaks, but <laughs> as far as I know, they speak a lot of Spanish in their comms. I know there's that one video, I don't know if you ever saw it, it was from Origin. It was a play against Game Lord. You may have heard of that team. Um, and uh, it was like, they were, it was act like calling in English and he's like, I can flash, I can flash. And it was like, it was, but it was a weird mix of like Spanish and English and the, their comms were kind of a bit of both. But I do think it's really interesting. But yeah, I think as you say, I would say their style is quite, Asian influenced. Um, I think, I don't know, at the same time, like, they also do seem quite flexible to me and willing to pick up new ideas. I think, for example, they put a lot of priority on a pick like, like Vi, for example, I would say. And I would say Vi now in Europe has become a lot more popular. Whereas even then, I don't feel like Vi was necessary, has been necessarily massively popular within like China, within like Southeast Asia. I think in China, it has seen some trending. Like there's definitely been times they played Vi, but I think in Southeast Asia, at least it's a little bit less common from the, at least from the games I've seen. Feel free to correct me. I'm a little idiot. Uh, yeah. But, but uh, for the most, you know, they, they, I think they are willing to pick up picks like that, try it a bit in scrims, and they're like, whoa, this actually works pretty well. They kind of just slot it into their play style. Um, I do think they are a little bit limited in the way they play, and that might be a problem as well. They do like to specifically go for like this pick heavy style. You know, Reese has quite a small champion pool, which is not as much of a problem if you're particularly good at the champions you have, which is like Ari, the Diana, um, you know. The Ari, Galio. Uh, the Galio, yeah, <laughs> uh, the Ari is in there, um, and you know, of course, it's Ari is another pick that you have to, you know, keep your eyes peeled for. But uh, you know, they are definitely very good with these kind of picks, and they do stress a lot of that synergy. You know, they they like to put Andres on these things like the Vi, the Lee Sin, and then you know he can set up with the Ari to to get Andres rolling, and he can be that superstar carry that he, you know when he gets going, he's like pretty much a mechanical monster on, on some of these picks. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't. Personally, know much about Ebro. I wouldn't say I've seen much of their games, so I wouldn't say I feel super confident making any like massive judgments. I, I, you know, I watched a couple of vods over the last few weeks just to kind of get a taste, but it doesn't seem there's anything like too crazy standing out. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> I guess it will be a bit of a disaster if you go down day one. Um, but at the same time, maybe NA can go down day one with us. You know, when we see a TSM versus Tribe, that's of course the other massive, uh, <laughs> the massive upset waiting to happen. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think. My opinion on Team Queso versus Zebra is that we shouldn't lose that matchup. I don't think Queso should lose that matchup. And if they do, I think it's a disaster <laughs> for us in, in the Horizon Cup. I genuinely think it's a disaster. <laughs> um, especially because we've got... If this was best of one, I would maybe make another mm. decision there, right? I'd maybe say, well, anything can happen in the best of one. But because it's a best of three, in general, the better team should come out on top. And I think I think that Team Queso in this situation probably is, from what I've seen, the better team. Ebro have... <sighs> They're not as I, they're very much more team fight orientated. And I think if you go into into Queso and you're trying to play pure team fight versus Queso, I think that's where Team Queso's strengths actually lie. So I, I think I think you know Queso have got better meta understanding. They've got better rotations. They've got better macro, and I think they will still beat you in the team fight. And I think one of the great things about Team Queso that I was really surprised about at the Origin series is I genuinely thought coming into this that um, that Ibu and what's the support's name. Uh, memorized. memorized memorized i thought ebu and memorized were the, the massive weak link of that team like i think they were like the weakest players on the entire roster yeah but they actually a expanded their champion pool really nicely and, and played generally very safe and and in sometimes ebu really stepped up as well like ebu expanded past being a zaya kaiser two trick and actually had a lot more a lot, lot more champions that he had to offer so i think i think they they played really well i think their entire team adapted really well at origin series and i think they just caught both Ricks and Game Lord a little bit, both you guys out, out, out when it came to like the way they played that, that, especially those early rotation metas that just weren't, we weren't, weren't able to as a region adapt to as quickly as we would liked. Um, plus also no one had to move to phones before the tournament on that team, so uh, they, were, <laughs> <laughs> they were all in a good spot. Uh, yeah, but I think, I think Team Kesa should win that matchup. If they, if, they, if they don't win that matchup, I think it's a disaster for Europe, and I think our like, chances of getting out of the group is, is hugely, hugely hurt. You mentioned the t the tribe gaming TSM matchup. That's that's an interesting one because had tribe gaming been allowed to play on iPads, for instance, I probably <laughs> the tribe should have won that matchup. But tribe gaming have had four players had to move over to, over to phone for this tournament, and that it might not sound like a big deal, but that is a huge deal for players that have played their entire mobile gaming careers on iPads. They the guys who played on Vainglory, like Tigers, Max, etc., they all played on iPads. You know, in Vainglory, then they moved over to Wild Rift playing on iPads to move to phone with like four weeks notice. I mean, I'm sure you could talk about it, um, uh, Snitch, because Leon and I think do, uh, who else on your team? Leon and Friend. Friend, friend changed, thing, right? yeah. 
And that's a really big ask for a competitive player to move from an iPad to a phone in, in just four weeks and try and play at the same level. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think Tribe, admittedly, I think they're a pretty good team. I think they've got a really solid macro understanding. I think like when you see them play like from from like a very holistic level, they're pretty good at the game and they've have got and starting is a really good mechanical player. Like starting is, I think, some of the best of the best in terms of mechanical ability. Um, but I think having four players move from iPad to phone, that kills your competitiveness, I think, going into into the Horizon Cup, honestly. Yeah, I guess it's gonna be tough for them, although they've got quite some time to work on it. I don't know. Like um as a as a coach it's difficult to say such things because yeah, I'm not really facing uh, mechanical issues and uh, I've mostly been coaching mechanical gods right now so I can't really tell uh, but for when it comes to like outside of the game they also quite surprised me and I think it's there they have a big asset both tribe and TQ uh, since they hired or at least added to their staff two SCA coaches or analysts or however you want to call them that's like a huge asset for that because even though like I'm not saying it's a mistake from other teams but at least no SEA, Chinese, or whatever team has some other regions coach, at least from what I heard, like not even LATAM, whatever. So EU and NA being able to say, okay, we have our meta, we have our visions, our IDs, and we absorb another regions and a good regions and good coaches, IDs, bios, and whatever it is, pulling it together, I think it can be quite some, quite some good work. Like, I'm not saying it's going to make a big difference. And as you say, like going to, to from iPad to phone can make a huge difference for them. Might be really tough. Uh, but I really think that can be surprising. And we've seen even League of Legends right now at Worlds last week's draft diff can just make a game unplayable, even though you're mechanically good or whatever. So here's to hoping uh, we get some draft diffs for, for our Western sides. Yeah, I think that is a good point about... So I'll cut you off. <laughs> I think that is a good point about staff, though. I think Queso did the same thing. I believe they picked up Guard, um, yep. who's, yeah, was SEA kind of, you know, player slash analyst. And yeah, I think it is good to get that kind of the other side, especially when you'll be going into this international event and you're getting any intel you can, especially from players that are, you know, they've been involved in all these SEA scrims. They've seen all these Chinese scrims. You know, they know how Korea, who I haven't even mentioned yet, um, you know, how, how they like to play as well. Uh, I think yeah, getting that kind of insider, kind of, you know, intel and having it on on your side can be really, really uh, relevant coming into some of these. You know, especially when you play these teams for the first time. You know, I mean, I'm sure a lot of these teams, if not all of them, will have scrimmed each other at this point. But going onto stage is always a bit of a different beast. So playing against this international style or this different type of drafting for the first time can definitely be a big thing. Yeah, tribe tribe hired Glaciox, Glaciox, yeah. and mm. then uh, yeah, and. And Queso picked up Guard, who actually used to be called Quatavoa in Vainglory, and he is a, uh, a a guy who played international Vainglory for ages, then moved over to Mobile Legends, and then came to Wildrift. So he's got like a very strong history in mobile gaming as well. And was kind of he coached his own team in Vainglory, like he was the coach and the captain and the, like a player. So he had like a lot of experience in terms of like drafting and and kind of like experimentation. But I think the biggest benefit is what you mentioned, Dooms. It's just like being able to understand the meta that you're coming into is really important for these teams and scrims alone can be good for it. But like having that coach's insight about which, which teams are prioritizing, which picks, which teams are like, play like have the standout players. Who do you need to kind of play more defensively against? Who do you need to sort of put the pressure on? Where's the weak links? That's what having like an, you know, in the field coach can really help you with. So I think it was a good plan by those guys to sort of bring, bring those into the fold. Um, but yeah, apart from that, like, obviously we've got two banger games tomorrow. We've got the, the, the two Chinese versus Southeast Asian series, but then realistically you'd, you'd want Team Queso and Tribe to beat EBG and TSM. Mm -hmm. That TSM series I'm not going to talk about because <laughs> my brain <laughs> melted even just watching it. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll give the Brazilians this. They're incredibly, incredibly fiery, and they, uh, they, they love to fight, and they'll throw everything that they have at the wall. They'll sometimes build Iceborne Gauntlet Corky, but they'll still throw Don't worry, he didn't make it. He didn't make it. Don't worry, he's not here. No, yeah, no. You know, deep breaths. We probably won't see that Corky build unless TSM really thought it was great when they beat it like two times. Uh <laughs> Iceborne got the Corky, man. Um, I guess the question is then, like, we were going to sort of talk about who you think might be the biggest surprise at the Horizon Cup. And my, my, this is might not be a super big surprise, but I think Katie Rolster could surprise a lot of people. I know mm. a lot of people. I know a lot of people are talking mostly about Southeast Asia and China, but I think Katie, whilst they obviously got like 
turbo stomped in the LCK versus LPL show matching stuff that we had. I think that they've had a lot of time to work on that and improve. And I think, I think, I think KT could be a bit of a surprise here. They'll they'll definitely throw a spanner in the works. I think. Yeah. Um. I don't know. I have like two ideas of surprise. Uh. Obviously, there's the KT one. Not a lot of people don't talk about it, as you said, and I'm really thinking they might they might have worked hard. Uh, especially since I've heard they've really put in the work of uh, players, they got some stuff ready, like they're really working towards their goals right now. Uh, I'll still bet on the the stage diff from uh, TQ. Like it's crazy how we we've talked about it dozens of hours and uh, here already since a couple of minutes. But yeah, I think both Game Lord and Rix were 20, 30, 40, 0 in scrims against TQ in two weeks before Origin series, and yeah, here we are at home, so <laughs> we can't really talk <laughs> compared to them. Their stage diff is, is incredible. Uh, but for a real true surprise, I will say for me, my what would surprise me the most is if TT can really win it all and like dropping zero, zero, zero wins uh, along the road with such, uh, such roster changes and role swaps. I would be really impressed and it would show right now, maybe to my disappointment, that the player just makes a difference no matter the staff, the preparation, the synergy, whatever. It's just the better player wins it. And that would be as much as a surprise as a good thing as a good thing to see for Wild Rift. Yeah, I think with regards for sleeper teams, it's like it all kind of comes to day two. Because obviously, the, I think the two biggest question marks aren't present on day one, which is Katie Rolster and Sengoku. Um, Sengoku is a, a big question mark, I think, of like, you know, Japan is very isolated, you know, no one really knows about the, the depth of teams there, like, even, you know, obviously, they have a lot of, um, very big names from uh, Arena Valor times, like Hack, um, and Rush, you know, obviously very successful Arena Valor players, I believe they have a massive tenure in, like, Thailand or Taiwan, I'm not 100% sure which one, but very, very successful, very well known, um, and, you know, you have to assume there's definitely at least some talent on this roster, right? And, I mean, how far will that go coming from a region where, yeah, there might not be the depth of of kind of, like, you know, competition relevant yet? It's hard to say. Um, I'm really excited for KT Rolster. I think uh, Isaka and Rattel are super great players. I, I love watching Isaka play mid. Super insane Diana player, super insane Zed player. And, yeah, Rattel on, on Baron, has just he was just super phenomenal within Korea. Um, I think Baron lane in general... I guess I can't say it as much now because Z kind of <laughs> is not there anymore. <laughs> I think Baron lane for me was probably like going to be my lane of the tournament. I think um, it would, I, at least going into it, I really feel like the teams with better Baron laners are going to be the big difference. Um, even I if I think, you know, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't even necessarily think the meta is going to be like crazy. I mean, I, even some picks like, you know, Camille has been nerfed quite a bit, you know, um, Darius isn't necessarily as good as he once was, just received the healing nerf, but I do think, I think a lot of these teams, especially coming from the West, I think both Tribe and TQ kind of have this issue where they either focus very heavily on weak side Baron lane, or their Baron lane is very untested, and they, you know, they, they tend to strength, both of them, I think both Tribe and TQ are good examples of Baron laners that tend to you know, go, go to, towards tanks nowadays, it's like the Renekton and the Darius, and I mean, obviously Renekton is an insane pick in general, <laughs> He's not just a tank, he'll also one-shot you. Um, but, you know, they generally lean towards these safer kind of weak side styles. And I think, from what I've seen of the Chinese Baron laners, from what I've seen from Rattel coming from Korea, I think that is going to get picked apart really quickly. And I think Baron lane is going to be a big focus between kind of this international play. Um, I, I, yeah, I think, honestly, it, it, and again, Z isn't there anymore. I think Z was going to be a big part of that picture as well kind of like picking apart these weaker players as soon as they get left on an island he's just gonna farm them um but now obviously he's moved back to mid lane but maybe the new tt baron lane, or baron lane is you know is the kind of the same kind of player who knows but i really think baron lane is going to be a big deal for this tournament I, I think you've raised a couple of good points there i think sengoku is definitely like a an unknown like they turbo stomped their region like if you if you look at what sengoku did in, in japan they had no competition they basically rolled everyone um, and as such, they didn't ever have to show much. Uh, they they basically, I think, I think in their grand finals they played ten champions. In yeah, yeah, I saw this one. Yeah, like, I, I looked. Like, uh, I didn't watch the games, but I looked at the the Liquipedia thing, and it was like, I was like, do they mess this up? Do they pick the same comp like three times? Yeah, they, they, they legit, <laughs> I, think, I, I think they legit played. I think the 
I think, I think their um, their jungler might have played Vi every game, and then the rest of the laners only picked one of two champions. Like it was, they they basically they basically played the same comp all the way through. But you know the, the question with them is like, is that the only stuff they can play, or mm. is that just because they were never forced to show anything else because they were just stomping? They've got like good players. They, they, they've got you know popular content creators, and they've got like hack and stuff on on that roster, right? So and they're previous AOV world champions, as far as I'm aware. So yeah. they've got like a, they've got a, a roster with a lot of pedigree in mobile gaming, and it's just a bit of an unknown about how they're going to match up. Obviously, Thunder Talk is a bit of a trial, like trial for fire. Them on the second day, like they have to kind of come into that matchup and feel like if they can win that, that we've massively underestimated Japan in general. But if they don't, then it's expected, right? Because Thunder Talk are you know supposed mm -hmm. to be a powerhouse in this tournament. And I, I like that you mentioned Baron Lane being like your lane. For me, it's jungle. I think we have got some nutty junglers. Like you've got. Um, you got uh, Ty. You've got uh, Tigers, who I think is a really good and very like good mental jungler. Uh, Andre, who's like clearly the best player on 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 Team Queso. I think you've got like a load of really strong junglers this tournament, and I feel like it's going to be very heavily dominated by a better jungler wins. I know most games can come sometimes come down to better jungler wins, but I think in general you're going to see a lot of jungle influence because you've just got these incredible jungle players on on uh, a lot of teams in this uh, in this tournament so i i agree with you that baron lane is stacked i just feel like we've got i i'm more leaning towards jungle which is a bit of a cop-out answer because jungle is the most influential role in the game oh but so brave that, wow yeah. <laughs> jungle <laughs> you say think, Ooh. like we've just got a lot of really 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 tight top tier junglers in this tournament right so that's kind of like where i'm looking to to see how that pans out and see how it influences things I'll completely disagree with both of you on, on those two. Like, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> why? I love like, it. I feel like Baron Lane is gonna be not sleepy, but like, I feel like if it comes down to what Origin series and SCA championships have shown, it's really how can I say that? Like, the stage diff makes one three ones or one four compositions with split pushes really so difficult. I feel like teams are way more cautious, like playing okay. This PO3 can, can cost me literally 100k dollars if I lose it, so I'm not gonna split push, I'm gonna stay with my team, whatever. And I feel like Baron laners are gonna be so tight under the turret with the team rotating together, a bit like Team Queso style. Like, obviously, plenty of people, if they had to do a Baron lane uh, ranking, for example, in EU, they wouldn't have put Acolyte on top, as you said. And yet, he was able to diff the top lanes thanks to the jungle, as you said. For me, jungle might matter a lot, but I feel like if teams are really as ahead of the meta as they are right now, I feel like support is going to be the biggest role right now. Why? Because there are so many ADCs that can just 1v2 on the turret, sit there and do pretty much nothing, especially if Varus is open. I'm not sure if he is mm, open he, or not. He is open, he is open, yeah. Yeah, if he is, then it's definitely going to be prior pick, I hope at least, and uh, be able to, to 1v2 on the turret. And the support room, like Rakan and such, is going to be really, really important. And if teams can set that up perfectly around, then then the mid and barrel lane diff is gonna it's gonna happen, but not because of the mid and barrel lane inher inherently. Like I feel like really support and junglers obviously uh, are gonna decide what's happening. Like supports for roaming and junglers for yeah smite diff. If if Doom isn't in a Rising Cup, then we're all good. <laughs> Four teams might diff. I think that it's funny because um, Thresh has become like a really popular support mm. in, in 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 as of late, and I think even in solo queue, I mean I'm a support main. Even in solo queue, I do the same thing, right? I do a lot of roam. I I generally tend to ditch my laner at like level five onwards and just roam with my jungle. And I think you you, you saw this in League in PC very heavily in the last meta that we just had about three months ago, where supports would actually leave their lane. They would be three or four levels behind the rest of the team, but they were so crucial in terms of influencing small skirmishes across the map. And especially now we've got two Rift Heralds. I think that really shakes up where supports have got to be on the map because like you 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 have to be there creating man advantages or setting up skirmishes or setting up picks or even just, you know, being there for pure vision control. Um, and I think you think that's especially now that we've got the second Rift Herald in the game, more neutral objectives have become worth fighting for early on. I think I think you're right. I think I think supports will be massively influential. And if you have supports that are still stuck in the mindset of two v two, take down my turret. I think those are the teams that are going to get caught out because there's going to be so much easy easy pressure applied by just rotating. And because and because experience means jack fucking shit in this game because you, you get you get so much experience like for free essentially. Oh, there um, goes our PG label. <laughs> <laughs> you can bleep, you can bleep me out in post. Uh, I think. <laughs> 
you know, I think because experience means so little, like supports can be free to do that and you, you barely get punished for it. You, you barely get punished for it. No, I think uh, especially the second Rift Herald is actually a great point because I didn't really consider it that this would be the first time pretty much any of these teams have had to play any stage games with two Rift Heralds in it because obviously that, that was patch 2.5, right? Um, and that happened after Origin Series and after, you know, after China wrapped up and after Korea wrapped up and everything kind of finished before that. So it's pretty interesting that, uh, yeah, that, that will obviously be a massive meta shift and will have to affect the way a lot of these players, especially supports and jungles, I think, the way they link up and stuff like this, um, it will be a massive difference and being ready to adapt to that kind of new objective style and being proficient in not only, you know, getting the heralds and knowing how to use them and, and stuff like this, I think will actually yeah, be a big, really big factor. Um, one thing you did mention, Dooms, about Baron Lane, and I guess that was why I kept bringing up Z, is that you said it was going to be pretty sleeper. And I was just thinking of this Chinese final where Z solo killed in like three games multiple times as like Fiora. And I, <laughs> I was thinking, I mean, that's what I'm imagining, you know, it's like these crazy, crazy Chinese Baron Laners just coming in and just getting chain solo kills and pulling massive kind of, uh, you know, pulling absolute wrath upon one side of the map. But yeah, I guess. Uh, you might be right with it, yeah, being a little bit a little bit slower paced and a little bit more support focused. But I, I do think, you know, as we talked about, you know, with Thresh and Ricard and these kind of more active supports kind of coming to the limelight with regards to the meta, I do think that opens up, you know, kind of these aggressive Baron Lane roams to get these kind of players ahead and give them opportunities and maybe split pushing could be more of a, you know, kind of an aim for some of these teams as a result of that. Yeah, that's very true. And just I'm reading in the chat in the same time, shout out to ATMN who really supports my vision. So support above jungle, mid Baron, and then Varus. Like not ADC, just Varus. You know, it's pretty <laughs> well aimed, perfect. There's maybe one other guy I would add, and that could be a good debate for both of you too. Varus and Zix. I'm really curious to see which teams are gonna let Zix open or not. Like I know it's been uh, in China, I see whatever. Like Zix is a BS, let's say to keep it PG, as he said. Uh, curious to see if Tribe. It's too late uh, now. He's ruined. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious to see if Tribe with Glaciox, uh, who doesn't really like Zix at least, uh, are gonna keep it open or not. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, I'm really curious to see how Zix is gonna be played, if he's gonna be open or not. And where he's played too, of course, like in mid, but it can be played anywhere. But if he's played ADC again, yeah, well, that's a second ADC. You can just put in your lane. Yeah, yeah exactly. Get your Rakan trash to rotate wherever you want and you're good to go. You know, you're not going to be dove because there's no wave to dive with. <laughs> it's impossible. So, yeah, I'm really curious to see that. I don't know if you got scrims inside about this one. Please I, share with us. I but, haven't uh, heard. I, 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 even if I had, I don't want to share some pick specific <laughs> stuff about scrims, right? Because the teams might not want to let leak that kind of stuff. But I think I, I, look, I could go on a rant about Ziggs in Wild Rift and how <laughs> he's just not he, his current kit is not fit for the for the way the game works. Just because towers in this game are like paper, you can hit them twice with Ziggs, uh, you know, and suddenly you've got a, a you know an execute range with your with your your satchel charge, and it's just ridiculous. That's the problem because because waves are so easy to push in this game and because Ziggs needs one wave most of the time when he's got like one or two items to just kill a tower it's it, like it, it's actually ridiculous how how like how much you can snowball the game just through pure global gold on towers with Ziggs it's really annoying I could go on a rant about that forever <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think I don't want you to uh, I don't want to take up the entire podcast with ranting about Ziggs uh, we talked about who you think might be the biggest surprise who do we think would be the biggest disappointment um, I'm gonna start. And I am going to say Team Secret. I think Team Secret might actually be the biggest disappointment at this event. I think mm. I think they are the weaker of the two SEA teams. I think they are caught up in a lot of the hype of, of the SEA region in general, but I think SBTC are better than them by a, a decent amount. Uh, I do think there is that buff of coming together and playing, but I think they could probably be the the, the disappointing one of the region. I, I'm happy to eat my words on that, by the way. I, <laughs> I've, I'm still hearing they're doing incredibly well in scrims, but I just think comparatively to maybe some of the other teams that we think are going to do well, I think Team Secret might be more of a disappointment there. I could have very easily said, you know, Tribe, because that was an easy one, but I think... So I think brave. Team... <laughs> <laughs> I, think team, I think Team Secret might be the, the team that is, is more disappointing than maybe some of the other teams in those strong regions. No, I think that's fair. I think the thing about Team Secret for me is how figured out they get, uh, at least from watching Team Secret's games, and I followed a lot of their stuff. I co-streamed a lot of the, the SEA region, um, especially during the, the recent Super Cups and stuff. And I always felt like Secret... 
they kind of like try to five head draft a lot and a lot of that revolves around Tatsuri and him playing like 76 billion different champions for presumably no reason um, but they really really seem to try to like edge and draft with these kind of weird niche picks like you know he, I mean I think Riven Mid has become a lot more of a staple around the world nowadays but at least at the time he was playing Riven Mid kind of ahead of everybody playing all of the Katarina and you know I just don't know that's a pick that should ever realistically work in competitive play and yet they were pulling out Katarina you know on stage in these big scale matches and then he would just find some random kills and super snowball and take over the game right and I'm like but can you really get away with that all the time can you really get away with that against better players are these the best players maybe SCA is the best in which case you know yes you can um but I do think it comes down to four secrets like how worked out do they get because yeah if you know all of their tricks and you know all of their you know if you will secrets um are they you know more easily solved and as a result more beatable yeah, speaking about those uh, weird champions, let's say, I remember I did, a, b before talking about uh, disappointments, I remember I did some analysis work for the SCA uh, championships. I don't know who was arguing with, I think it was Glaciox about Ziggs and another champion, I can't remember which one, who in EU were considered really like S++ tier for sure. And in SCA they, they said, yeah, it's not that good, you know, uh, only, what did they say again? Yeah, good teams know how to beat them, you know, it's, it's if you're not good enough, you're going to be beaten. I was like, okay, Copy. thanks. <laughs> but um, I really did some analysis then. If you took the top five teams from the SCA Championship, they these champions like 15% win rates between two less good teams, like out of top five, or, uh, or like top five versus lower teams or whatever. But whenever you took only the top five teams between each other, those champions had like 70, 75 plus percent win rate. Absolutely crazy. So yeah, the champions that we deem are cracked, as you say, are cracked for a reason and we know what you're talking about. So yeah, as you say, like those champions pool can't be extensible and you may be kind of fun against weaker teams, but I'm curious to see what they're going to pick against T, SBTC, EKG, etc. for sure. Now about disappointment, I see two contenders for sure. Um, Weirdly enough, I'm considering like disappointment, you gotta have a shit ton of, of ambition to be disappointed in, in the first place. So I'm really looking forward to the favorites. And I think it's gonna be either SBTC or TT. Why? Because TT, if they win, it's gonna be great and it's gonna be a surprise because they changed a lot. But if they lose, they can't blame everything on the changes. And you know, their TT, their Chinese champions, they got to represent. If they don't win this or at least do top two, it's going to be a disappointment, insane for sure. Uh, and then SBTC, I feel like the same. SCA is so hyped. But if they don't win it all, I feel like they're going to be a huge disappointment for SCA. And maybe not a surprise, but at least like, okay, SCA didn't win. It's going to have an impact not only now, but even for the next years of, okay, SCA didn't win this, you know, like don't overhype this for sure. Like remember the first Wild Rift world, Scapa. Uh, <laughs> SCA didn't win this and you were hyped, so, so chill out. So yeah, SBTC losing now or at least not winning this could be a huge disappointment, not only now, but yeah, for several years. I see that and i think that's part of the reason why i said team secret would be my disappointment i think i i i, I think that sbtc are less likely to be a disappointment than team secret but i think team secret it depends on on a like snitch very correctly said their draft is sometimes they're trying to 5d chess when you don't even need to play 2d chess like it, it's, it's 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 sometimes a little too much <laughs> but like one of their big strengths is that they can they can play champions oceans but when i always I always take that with a pinch of salt, right? Because I don't think a pro player can play every single champion that they claim to have in their champion pool to the same level. So, like, you know, you know, if you randomly pick something mid that has never been seen before and you're like, oh my God, he's pulling something crazy. I'm like, but how good, how practiced is he with the, in, in, in all these matchups? Does he know the, the, the break points? Does he know the power spikes? You know, does he know when he can go in and when he can't go in? That, 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 those, those little nuances, I just don't think you can know that for a, a very, very, very large selection of champions. I think you can, you know, probably do it comfortably between five and ten. But like if you suddenly start in sort of like a, a, in the realms of like 15 or 20 champions on the roster that you're trying to pull out in mid, I don't actually think you can capably play them all at the same level. So I think that can sometimes be a bit, bit of a drawback, which does kind of bring us on to the, uh, the interesting question of who you think might be the tournament MVP, because there will probably be a tournament MVP at the end. It doesn't always have to go to the winning team. 
Um, but there will be a tournament MVP selected. I already know who I'm voting for, and it's 100% Huiba. Is it Huiba by any chance? Is it Huiba? Huiba is getting, my, it, it's, it's Huiba? Huiba. <laughs> Huiba is getting my tournament MVP right now. Uh, but obviously, <laughs> there are plenty of players out there that might deserve it. But Huiba is my boy, and he's getting it. So uh, that's my selection. And I think I'll eat my. Like, look, if, if Dakun looked like sh sugar tomorrow versus SBDC, then. It's too late. You ruined it's us. Too late. I have already ruined <laughs> If they if they look bad and then Huiba and runs it down, then I'm going to look silly. But I, I think they they built this roster around him for a reason. He is really just that good, and that's yeah, that's my 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 sort of vote for MVP. Yeah, I mean, I think my vote along the same lines would have been Z from Thunder Talk, but yeah, it's just not sure now. He switched from Baron Lane to me. I'm telling you, he was like solo killing Dustwin like every game. I think Dustwin was like 05 on Darius in game one, and like all of his deaths were getting just farmed by Z in Baron Lane. It's just, it's, it's a real shame, I think. I mean, maybe not. I mean, the, from what I've heard, and I mean, I only have so many connections, you know, that the LPL slash Chinese scene, but, you know, the few claims I've heard is that Z was the best mid laner in China. And it was not close. And I was like during the Ignite era where it was like the original Ignite and they were super good. And I'm pretty sure he was the mid laner for that roster. Um, and then disappeared for a while. Then got picked up by Thunder Talk where they signed a lot of the Ignite players. Roll swapped to Baron Lane to let Fabi come in and play mid lane. But he's now gone to ADC. So, you know. <laughs> But now he's back in mid lane, and this is his role, supposedly. And I mean, you know, even just with the small amount of time he had in Baron lane, he was crushing these established players, absolutely dominating them in lane. I think it's much harder to do that in mid, to be honest. I think, you know, if I had to pick a role where the most solo kills were going to happen, I honestly think mid would probably be the least likely lane. I think it's just generally a lot of these matchups, unless you get like these, you know, assassins versus assassins, it's just not... Uh, a particularly hostile lane, you know, due to like the lane length and, you know, because everybody runs Sweet Tooth because gold is delicious. It just means that, you know, you often don't kind of see these 1v1s. Um, but I think if Thunder Talk do still perform, it will be because of him. Ah, you've picked uh, the two favorites already. Um, <laughs> I don't now you can, I can, you can drive it home with Ruiz. <laughs> <laughs> Sure thing. Uh, stage diff MVP for sure. Nah, um, I don't think I have a name just like that. Like I'm really gonna look when when teams perform. I'm gonna look maybe at other stuff. Like uh, you guys really seem to focus on okay who who drives the team who was built around. I'm really gonna look other stuff as MVP for my part. Like um, I'm hoping it's not gonna end up like uh, in soccer or whatever. Like okay, like whoever makes the most goals or assists, like whoever is most attacking person wins the the MVP title. I'm really looking forward for the playmakers. Like I'm um, I'm really loving the shadow people. So yeah, anyone who creates stuff, as you said, like as I said, uh, the supports for example, etc. Whoever makes the plays and maybe also might suffer in draft for example. Like someone like Tatsuri, as you said, he might be okay. He's mid. But uh, if he suffers in draft and says, okay, I'm going to blind mid, I'm going to enjoy weak lanes and suffer for you guys, uh, be a tank or whatever it is, that's going to be my shining point to be the MVP. So if, as you said, that's Uri, I don't know him well enough, but uh, if he's a guy that, okay, is able to adapt to whatever is needed for his team and can bring in shiny picks to really deserve an MVP title, but also suffer and, how can I say that, like leave space for his own team, that's what I'm really gonna like and, and vote for as MVP. That's for sure. I, mean, I, no. I think, yeah, especially in the roaming support meta, like I think there will be a lot of supports that get undervalued in terms of like those MVP awards. I'm hoping that you know if, if that does come, come to be the case, but I know I've seen Huiba play, man. That guy's cracked. It's actually <laughs> legit cracked. <laughs> Any Huiba <laughs> fans? Oh, I am hearing some rumblings. I no, I do think good biased. supports. I would you know. not be biased in my in my cast tomorrow. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> what role is Huiba? Yeah, mid lane, mid lane okay. for Darkun, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, I I do think good. I do think good supports will have a chance to shine, though. I mean, I think, as we've said, like, I think, you know, at least within scrims in Europe and, you know, rumblings of scrims uh, from from Horizon, I do think this kind of aggressive support meta is getting pushed more and more, especially with, yeah, there's more objectives to play for, you know. I think support just in general is leveling up a lot. I think for a long time it's been very passive enchanted gameplay, but even in, you know, even in my solo queue nowadays, there are more people playing Thresh, there's more people playing Rakan. They make these aggressive roams and rotations, you know, oh, my AD carry sucks, I'm just going to go Baron lane. You know, they get the Baron lane third, they win the game. I think this kind of playstyle is more towards traditional support than we see in PC. You know, it's these Thresh players, there's, you know, Leona, 
Um, you recall on these players who are a lot more flexible in the map, they recognize their own timings, you know, they recognize when they can move and what their actual team's win condition is, because it's not always necessarily ADC, you know, like we talked about, kind of, they having this Varus or this, this Ziggs and these champions, you know, you don't need to put a lot of energy into getting them stronger necessarily. These champions will always do their job, right? And I think a lot of ADCs are even like that, like, you know, even when we get past the initial two, you know, stuff like Ezreal, I mean, he hasn't been super high prior outside of Europe, and I guess even Team Kesa, you know, actually, I think at Ezreal probably won't even see him. Uh, but, you know, even, like, a lot of the, the, the major ADCs, I guess, like, Corky and, uh, I, you know, obviously the Vayne is an example of a pick that would need a bit more help, but a lot of them, I think, are generally a bit more self-sufficient, and they don't require these massive, you know, gold injections to perform. Um, so these supports can be a lot more flexible on the map. They can focus on mid lane, they can focus on baron lane, or even just linking up with the jungle in general. And I do expect to see a lot of leveled up support gameplay kind of throughout this tournament in general. Yeah, I, I think I think you're gonna be completely spot on. I think I think if we do see Enchanter supports, you know, we might see Lucian Nami lanes. We might see Lulu Vane. I think you know, if if we see Lulu, it's obviously going to be setting up for kind of a later game scaling carry. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think it was, it should see more aggressive roam orientated supports this time round, and uh, I'm I'm kind of excited for that. Also, like the 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 recent changes that they made to like support gold generation, you actually make mm -hmm. a lot of gold on support now, like. You, you're not like left starving for gold like you were in previous patches. I think actually you can make a decent amount of gold as support and actually be relatively impactful. In my solo queue games, I legit play Dead Man's Plate, Blade of the Ruin King, Thresh. Like I actually, I actually legit just do that. You didn't need to share that information. No, we we I, all we all respected you before this. Uh, I do it because every AD carry I play with in solo queue is trash, and so therefore I need to play. Uh, I need to play on hit thresh to actually uh, to actually win the game. It's the only uh, but, way. It's the only I, way. I have the gold to. I have the gold mm. to actually make the, the the items. You know, like whereas I wouldn't have been able to do that before. Um, <laughs> but you know. I, oh, is that when you do it with Stuart? You have to go for that build. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, yeah I, I realize Stuart now what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Garbage. Stuart. Yeah, no, it makes cool. sense. Anyway. No, I, no, I do I think don't. that's a really good point as well. It kind of it pushes that narrative even more, right? Now supports are getting more gold. They don't have to be sitting in lane farming farming CS anymore, you know, farming, but which I mean just standing near the ADC while they farm and then you, you absorb the gold. But they don't need to be doing that as much now because they have this this excess global gold that they're kind of just receiving and they can focus more on playmaking and holding positions and warding and all this kind of like I think the more interesting parts of the support game rather than just kind of AFK in lane. Yeah. I do think the two enchanters you mentioned are the ones we will likely see, which is Nami and is is Lulu. Uh, Nami did get a small nerf on 2.5a to the ultimate cooldown, but overall I don't expect to see her disappear. I think she's still pretty prevalent, and yeah, I think the Lucia ADC is something a lot of teams will probably still look for here and there. Um, and obviously she has great synergy with that. Not as good as PC, because she can't abuse Electrocute, but, you know, that's probably for the best, <laughs> given Wildrest's damage thresholds. Um, you know, as far as the tank supports go, I think, you know, we'll probably see a lot of Galio, probably still see Gragas, hopefully not with Winter's Approach, but almost certainly with Winter's Approach. Um, and then, you know, the Thresh and the Rakan, and I think that'll probably be the support pool that we'll probably end up seeing. Yeah, that's probably, like, the whole thing for the most part, unless anybody gets too crazy. Might but yeah, lanes, right? We're gonna, we might yeah, yeah I, I, do yeah. I consider Senna a support? I guess some of the supports play it. Um, I would expect <laughs> no, Senna to be to be pretty high prior. Like, it would be like Galio support with Senna, right? Like yeah, know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. Whereas yeah. Galio just ends up farming. It's, it's weird, mm -hmm. you know. It's very difficult to really like say support in that matchup because Galio is mm -hmm. one that's getting the gold, and then Senna does kind of take that supportive role. But yeah, I think I think we will see some fasting center lanes if it's available to people. And uh, you know, I think the teams will put a decent amount of priority on it because center just center in this game is just ludicrously strong if you can play her in competitive because the soul mm -hmm. generate the soul generation is absolutely broken and you can get like eighty souls in ten minutes and then it's just <laughs> start firing halfway across the map and it's just absolutely it's broken. Actually, not true. She received a massive nerf to her soul generation when yeah, killing that. minions. Um, which really, really <laughs> slowed her down because now she generates way less souls when killing minions, which really helped uh, destroy that fasting play style. But uh, I do think, yeah, I definitely think Senna will be high prior. I mean, what do you guys think the other high prior champions will probably be? We talked about the Ziggs. I personally think, I think, you know, obviously you know, we've had a huge thing about Ziggs and, you know, we've always thought it's Toba Broken, it's always first banned. I don't think Queso is a Ziggs team. Um, they did play it at Origin, it didn't look great, they lost it at Origin. I think, you know, most European teams wouldn't lose it at Origin, <laughs> to be honest, because um, I just think it's not really Ruiz's kind of champion, we kind of talked about his hero pool earlier. Um, but I think, 
I do agree that Ziggs might see more play than he did before, but then it might be for different reasons, like that kind of heavy roam support meta. It lets you put a Ziggs bot lane and he could just chill, right? Whereas before, he might not have been as prominent, kind of like with Enchanters being a bit, a bit stronger and this kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we could see more Ziggs, but it might, you know, we can't exactly be like, haha, we told you so, because it might be for different meta implications than what kind of we were used to from Europe, which was like this, this mid laner that just controlled the whole map and you couldn't start any objectives and then you just got two items and one shot your whole team at AoE and, uh, yeah, I think, I think it might be slightly different draft, you know, theory that gets him kind of to like that high prior place. Yeah, two, two things you said that make me kind of sad. First, please, as a Lulu Brom two trick, play those champions. They're amazing. <laughs> please. <laughs> now, but more seriously, like yeah, as you said, the Zegs uh, team case so might not look like a team like it. Like um, I was the one I remember a uh, quick uh, outro. Uh, in Origin series when we were zero two down to team case, so I came back to the team and said, okay, you know what? Let's leave Zegs open. Whatever, we don't care. <laughs> Let's try it. So yeah, definitely TQ isn't uh, really the the Zex team for sure. Uh, other prior picks, I really feel like, although I don't think it's going to be the impactful lane gameplay-wise, I think it's going to be the most ban lane, baron lane for sure. There are so many OP baron laners right now that can fit in so many roles. They're so flexible in their playstyle, in their positions, whatever. Whether it's Riven, Renekton, Gragas, like, and they can all be played in at least two, three, sometimes even four positions if, if, you, if you flex Gragas correctly. So yeah, there, that lane is going to be heavily banned for sure. Uh, other prior picks, I feel... I don't know if Jungle Lee Sin is going to be that prior again, because we're going to see, as you said, really highly skilled mechanical junglers who all like to dominate the lane, get those early plays, and really be able to impact in early. Like, I don't think we're going to have heavy teamfight uh, junglers, like the Wukong, you know, passively sleeps until level 5, and then, uh, and then wakes up. Uh, we're gonna see some Lee Sin, Vag, Sin, as you said. At least I hope so. Um, I'm looking for one pick in particular. Yeah, I'm. I'm hoping at least the virus is gonna be the the next prior pick for sure. Like if he isn't, I would be really surprised and curious to see, or at least to know why. Like is there a counter or whatever? But I'm really looking forward to yeah those the Baron lane bands for one, and then the early junglers and the virus. That's for me my my heavy picks. I always laugh when people say jungler sleeps to level five because in Wild Rift that's like two minutes into the game. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 like, it's like first clear. Oh, I'm level five after first clear. Great. Um, but no, I mean, at the end of the day, I always find that it, just a, a side point: junglers that require level five to be good usually just need to have lanes with prio because if you have a jungler that, that, that requires level five to be good if you've got a prio mid or a prior baron lane you could at least get one of the scuttlers y you have no problem because then you're just going to get level five on your first clear and you shouldn't have an issue right so so like i think as long as you're drafting one lane with prio with a level five de dependent jungler you're usually fine because nothing much happens before that point anyway because in general the first point of action that we see is around first scuttles and that's usually because people are either think that they've got prior and they can roam out or they miss you know they misinterpret their prior and then end up throwing the game my pick that i think is going to dominate will be galio i think galio is going to be a really high priority pick for a lot of these teams i think both support and mid um i think like a lot of these teams are like super team fight focused and i think galio is the most broken team fight champion in the game um, and so I just think we'll probably see a decent amount of Galio prioritized for like, I know Southeast Asia loves it. They play it a lot with Fasting Center, but they also play it, play it mid. Um, obviously, it's one of Ruiz's three trick champions. So, you know, he's going to be uh, he's it's gonna on be the list. That. So I, I think I think Galio myself would be like the, the thing that I'm looking towards. I think Thresh will be quite highly prioed, especially amongst the teams that have been practicing a lot in like Southeast Asia and, and China. But I agree with your assessments, to be honest with you. I think you've all selected champions that in general are going to be relatively high prior. I think there's going to be some question marks around like Ziggs and whether other regions prioritize it as much as like we did in Europe. Um, I hope they do because he's a turbo busted champion. Uh, but yeah, I think um, I think we'll just have to see. I, I, we I hope. Like, yeah. <laughs> if you were to like straight up pick a winner for Origin Series now, like if you had to put your money on one team, Horizon win. Cup, you mean? Or am I going back uh, yeah. in time? Oh, if yeah, I had to pick for Origin <laughs> Series, I think I would pick Team Queso. Um, <laughs> and big, I, I might even put like a million euros on Team yeah, Queso, yeah, honestly, yeah, for Origin Series. Very, very if I, if you really had to twist my arm. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I'll start with Doom. I'll start with Doom's though, because he he got last oh. pick on the uh, on the MVP. So I'll give him first pick on on Team. One. Um. 
you know what? I wouldn't bet a lot of money on it. <laughs> I like my money. But uh, <laughs> the one I can spare, at least, I would put it on TT. Like, they, they seem so confident with all their, their swaps. I want to believe in them. And as you said, uh, the Z dominance, I'm going to remove that favorite pick from you, uh, Snitch. You got to choose another <laughs> baby to support. So I'm going for TT. I mean, well, you know me. I'm a huge fan of uh, Huiba. I'm actually his biggest fan. Like, you should have seen. I was actually doing rehearsals for the Horizon Cup, and I was watching these scrims between TT and Darkrin, and he was destroying them with Akali. It was unbelievable. So that's why I've decided to go with Darkrin Gaming as my favorite. Um, I honestly just think, you know, I would have gone Thunder Talk, but I just, I just can't, I can't <laughs> believe in the team. With no further info, you know, maybe in three days I'll change my mind when I see some of their matches, but with no further info, I just cannot believe in a team with three roll swaps and two roster swaps or oh, sorry three roster swaps and two roll swaps um it just doesn't seem plausible to me that they could still be good enough to win and if they are then, then you know the the players and the staff must be, be phenomenal around that you know like the the original two and getting everyone else up to speed so quickly would just be like an insane feat so i mean honestly for like the pseudo cinderella story i think it'd be awesome if thunder talk still won for that reason but i think i do have to believe that dark and you know, based off their, their history of dominance in China and being like, the other teams are still up against OMG and OMG looking super far ahead of everybody and China looking, you know, supposedly super far ahead as a region. I do think that Dark can have to be my, my favorite choice. And obviously I'm such a huge Weber fan. Did I mention I was doing rehearsals and I watched some scrims? Excalibur, what's your take? Well, uh, <laughs> my pick's gone. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you actually can't pick the same team. It's forbidden. No, it's forbidden to pick the same team. Uh, just for the sake of interest, I'm going to go. I'm going to ask the SBTC. I think if I wasn't going to go for Darkoon, I would have gone for SBTC. I think Vietnam has got such a pedigree in mobile esports, and I think they've got a lot of really talented players over there. Um, so I think that SBTC would be my pick. Then if I can't go for Darkoon, I'm going for SBTC. And I, like I said, I believe that first series of the day is the two strongest teams in the tournament. So if Darkoon isn't going to win it, SBTC is... Uh, and they beat Southeast Asia, which is an incredibly diverse and very strong region in general. So winning that is no small feat. And I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I would peg SBTC to be my winner if I put a small amount of money on it. Like like Doom said, I'm not sure I'd put a huge amount now on because there are so many <laughs> good teams. Um, but I think that's what's nice. It's like, I don't think this is like a one-sided tournament. Like, I think there is quite a lot of top teams. I think even like we've mentioned, like KT Rolster could definitely come mm. in and compete. I'll be... Brutally honest, I don't think Kesu and Tribe can really compete at that the level mm. above where the, the Chinese and the, the Southeast Asian teams are right now, but I'm willing to be proven wrong, and I think Doom hit the nail on the head. There might be a stage buff if Ruiz just starts shouting down the opposition like he did with Rix in the final. <laughs> then, like, like we could, we could literally Depends how close the, the sets are together. You know, if they're right next to each other, stage. then Keso is straight to number one. And it's quite big. It's not a, it's not a, Oh, it's that's a huge weird. nerf to Keso. What are they thinking? It's a nerf to Keso because it's, it's a big stage. The stage looks lit, by the way. It's really nice. Um, okay, like, spoilers? But, uh, yeah, sorry, mate. It's, it it looks good. That's the spoiler. Um, Actually, I already saw that. I already saw that from Leroy on Twitter. So, uh, yeah. okay. Shout out to Leroy. You know, what a lad. he's like he's like the Southeast Asian streamer version of me. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I'm hoping to get him on for some some of the co streams I'm doing. I mean, it'd be a good laugh. I think. I think Leroy would be great. But I do think um, KT Rolster are probably my dark horse, to be honest yeah, as well. Yeah. Like I, I, I really, you know, I said before about those early is I really think they are pretty cracked. Um, and I think if any, if any of the teams that is in Southeast Asian and you know Chinese had a good shot, I think it is you know the Korean, the Korean seed. I think they really do have a good shot. I'd agree with you. I think they're the best dark horse out of the top four that you can mm -hmm. go for. Sengoku, obviously, I have question marks on. Those will probably get answered on Sunday when we see them play versus TG, mm -hmm. but. But I think uh, I think if you are going to pick someone outside the big four here, it has to be KT. I, I honestly I would love to be hyping up Team Queso, and I'd love to be like getting all behind Europe. But I still think we need time to develop as a region. I think we don't have the same mobile pedigree that these other regions do. Um, you know, even Snitch, like you picked up mobile gaming what like when Wild Rift came out, whereas these mm -hmm. guys had been playing AOV and Honor of Kings and Mobile Legends for years before Wild Rift hit the stage and. I know we had experience in Vainglory, but it was such a different control scheme and such a different style of play that there was oh, the only thing that you're you're really transferring over is is MOBA knowledge at the end mm -hmm, of the day. Yeah. When it came, you know, playing Vainglory to to Wild Rift is like playing PC, PC League to Wild Rift. It's just mm -hmm. so different that you can't re you can't really make that direct move. And and 
I know we did have some AOV players. Like, I know a lot of your Game Lord boys were AOV players. And, you know... I, I Keso know as well. Keso have a lot of AOV names. Yeah, to be yeah, fair. And, yeah. and Mobile Legends players, right? Andre came from Mobile Legends, I think. Mm, um, yeah, he did, yeah. But I think that they still have not been playing those games as long as the mm. guys in Southeast Asia and China have. And also, yeah. it's just so cultural over there that you... You're playing it from a very young age anyway, like because that is the games that you get into when you when you're growing up, you know. Um, and we've got a long way culturally as a region to go to kind of get to the point where we're even contesting in terms of the way that we we kind of scout talent and build talent in this region because we just don't have the same kind of pipelines that Southeast Asia and China do, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I was say even if I don't support EU, I'd love to support NA as well, but I feel like they have a lot of the same problems, you know? I mean, they all yeah. come from Vainglory, but it, I, you just look at Tribe's dominance of the region and you just have to think this team isn't being tested, you know? I think the closest, honestly, was NME. We're quite, we're quite close quite a few times. They even beat them in, like, a series before the the, the summer of the series. They ended up taking uh, a tournament off them that was kind of like more of a minor Zio's one. Cracked. Zio is cracked. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think enemy are creative in draft. They had these like fresh ideas that did push tribe quite a few times. But then as soon as they played against standard teams like the you know Immortals and Sentinels and and Cloud Nine, it just felt like tribe were just so far above and beyond. Like half the like at least ninety percent of the games they played, you know, that I just I feel like they're just gonna hit these players that don't fall over as easily, you know, and it's just gonna be a much much harder struggle. Yeah, and the huge. Not a buff, but like a yeah, huge difference between West and East, is, especially for a first year of Wild Rift. As you said, it's not really anchored, you know, culture. Like when we have to schedule, schedule sorry, uh, scrims in EU, and I'm pretty sure it's the same in NA, you've got what, one, two scrims per day at a maximum. Maybe at Origin Series you had three, but that's really like exceptional. Uh, whereas the daily schedule of each Chinese SCA teams, and I'm pretty sure KT too. They are wondering if they should go from 10 to, to 6 scrims a day, you know, because it might be too much. I was like, what? I want that. Like, please <laughs> give it to me. Like, uh, really. So, yeah, it's it's crazy the difference in everything they can try out and test and just, yeah, give it a try and, and practice all together is huge. So, I definitely uh, agree with you that KT is, is going to be the the fifth, yeah, the fifth one uh, after the top four. And maybe we can surprise someone who performs less in the top four mm. i think that brings us nicely on to ecosystems in 2022 because a part of the way that you change this especially for europe is by having the ecosystem to back you up you know you want to have a, a ecosystem that you feel is sustainable and you feel like there's something to play for and that's how you retain teams that's how you retain talent in the long term and that is kind of like where i'm now thinking we should kind of talk about what are your what are your thoughts for 2022 I'm going to add a context. I'm probably not going to talk too much on this subject because I have seen a little bit about the plans for 20... Shut up, Jake. <laughs> well, I'm bit... so important. <laughs> <sighs> Only because I was voicing over something. I wasn't told specifically, uh, but I've seen a little Ooh. bit of the 2022 plans and I don't want to talk about it before Riot are ready to talk about it. Um, but I'd like to know from your perspective, from a coach and a player perspective, like what are you hoping for in terms of 2022? Go ahead, Snitch. I was first last time. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think for me, it's just, yeah, it's kind of the idea of consistency. Um, I, I think, you know, one of the big things, and we talk about, you know, teams only scrimming two blocks a day and this kind of thing, and I think a big part of that is that a lot of people can't afford to commit full-time, right? A lot of players are still in school, a lot of players are, you know, still working jobs and stuff, or just don't have, you know, the, the comfort, I guess, of, of being able to consider this a job, right? Like, they just don't have the, the necessary income or even the consistency, you know? When, when there's a tournament every month and you don't get the winnings for two months or whatever, you know, it's just, it's not really realistic, I think, for a lot of players. And I think when you do want to get talent getting more heavily involved and being able to consider this full-time, I think, yeah, having not even necessarily a league, but I think that is the easiest way probably to have something going on consistently, but at least giving, you know, people a, a, a long-term schedule of stuff to look forward to, which I think Origin Series did do a good job of, of at least giving us, you know, these three months, you're going to have these tournaments, then you're going to have this big land, you can play for all of this, you know, and then at least, you know, for us and, and, and Ricks, we were all super confident. We were like, okay, yeah, we have this, this full schedule lined up, you know, we want to practice this much and, you know, we have to be ready for these dates and this kind of stuff. And it was great to have that feeling. So yeah, I definitely just, I would like to see more of a long-term plan with regards to like giving us clear goals throughout the year. I'd love to see, you know, more, something that Heroes of the Storm, I think did really well was they created kind of like smaller international competitions. And I know Riot have done this in the past within League of Legends with stuff like Rift Rivals. 
Um, I think that would be a great thing to get involved in is kind of getting these smaller internationals where it's like, hey, here's NA and EU, they're going to meet and clash. You know, I think that stuff is really cool. And it's another great way to kind of like give you this kind of like this drive to work towards, right? Because within Heroes of the Storm, we had our like yearly league and then it was like the first quarter. And then it was like, now you're going to go play an international event against NA and it's going to be just EU and NA teams, you know? And it's this really hype event where all the NA players, you know, they get super hype with their, their fans and stuff and all the European players get super hype with their fans. And, you know, it brings a lot of... Uh, kind of like you know great kind of you know everybody loves the culture of the you know the western region war and also we don't get stomped by the eastern teams when there's only western teams there which is a nice boon <laughs> but uh yeah i would say i would just love to see a long-term plan with kind of yeah, like those big events that people can look forward to and kind of work towards but yeah at least giving more players the confidence to be able to pursue it as a full thing without worrying about stuff like, you know, will I have the money to do this? Can I afford to put all my time into this and be sure I'll be getting something out of it? Just a little bit more reassurance for kind of the talent to have that opportunity. Yeah. Um, if I had to summarize what I want for 2022, like, I feel like uh, I made my list for Santa Claus, maybe, but uh, <laughs> I really want three things that stand out as uh, a way to, first, maybe EU-centered, we're maybe the only region where no big org kind of has entered yet. Like I know uh, NA has Clan 9, TSM and LATAM, whatever you want. Like every region is a big org. In EU, the biggest we have is likely yeah, TQ, Rix, Game Lord eventually. It's not that big, or at least no, no such big assets, uh, which costs a lot to the region. Because I want EU to step up a lot, like not to give any numbers or whatever. But yeah, EU as a region is at least two or three times uh, behind financially between behind any other region, which is a lot. Uh, and as Snitch said, it matters when it comes to scheduling, teams being able to, to scrim more than once or twice a day. But this would have a really big impact of, okay, Riot has to give guarantees, uh, which leads to my second point, which is, yeah, either a league or... I feel like we're a bit stuck, uh, like Brawl Stars is right now in mobile gaming. Like, it's mobile gaming, it's not that recognized. Uh, Big orgs maybe don't want to invest because, you know, one team can go to a league where in one event where you have to perform. So there's a lot of RNG kind of like it's it's really around one event uh, centered. I really want something that's more long lasting with more multi finals, more events lasting to yeah, really one big thing that would uh, lead to worlds with maybe two or three teams for regions, more spots. And then one last thing I would add is really keeping up uh, less esports centers, but all those events which are really good. Like the more advertising we can have around the game, may it be through Arcane, through events. Like I saw in China, we did an event where um, about uh, EDG winning worlds, you know, like events like that can drive people towards Wild Rift and that can only benefit the whole esports scene. So, yeah, that's really three big things I want to see involved like EU to grow as, as a region certainty for bigger orcs and then yeah get the more people because yeah the more the merrier we're gonna be happy yeah i mean i i have le lessons from vainglory where i really don't want I, the riot is a different company to super even mega corp riot's wallet is much deeper and they can afford to make much further much bigger losses but i definitely don't want riot to overreach um and i definitely don't think wild rift is ready for league formats yet i just don't think we're there i think we need more time to get to the point mm -hmm. where we have either the player base and the viewership to support a league format um but that but like my ultimate goal for wild rift would to have a league be to have a league format i would love to have like a mini L lec type thing that we have to work towards in the future because that gives orcs like uh safety you know it gives them a safety net but being part of a league it gives you safety of that you'll always be on screen you'll always have time uh, for exposure you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so that'd be my, my ultimate goal but i definitely don't want riot to start like overreaching to the point where they are paying way too much for what wild rift's worth because i think we holistically can look at wild rift and say well it's not the viewership isn't there yet you know like we're not at a point where you know this game is popping off this game does need time to scale up this game does need more investment on from an advertising perspective it needs to, it basically as doom said we need to get more players to the door, especially in the Western um, Hemisphere. So Hemisphere is not the right word. The Western area of, of, of you know, the world. We, we need to get more players to the door. Um, so I think what we're do what's happened this year has been nice. I've loved that the Horizon Cup is even a thing. I'm really hoping for a world next year, you know, like a, a sort of a more official world where there are teams feeding into it. 
Um, but I, you know, I guess we'll have to see when they actually put the announcement out about what you know, because I actually can't even remember fully the the, the the whole thing. But I think <laughs> hopefully we'll have something that it goes along those lines, and there'll be a, a like a really nice world tournament. I also love to have more than one seed from like the regions like Europe and North America go to mm-hmm. worlds. Um, I don't know if that's going to be the case or not, but I would love to have more than one seed going from our region because the Horizon Cup was definitely not supposed to be a Worlds, right? It was it was supposed to be like a, a standalone tournament that they didn't really want to consider Worlds. In fact, I think I'm pretty sure internally, Riot didn't really want to consider the Horizon Cup a Worlds tournament because of the fact we didn't have many teams going from some of the major regions. Um, so I, I think even if you look back, if, we, if we're going to look at like five years in the future and look back at the Horizon Cup, I don't think many people will count it as a Worlds. I think they'll just count it as a big international tournament. Uh, and then Worlds will start from you know, whenever Riot decides to put that into the into the books. But yeah, I think uh, I think you guys have raised some good points. And I think, you know, if Riot were to look at those points, it'd help hopefully shape mm. shape some things in the future. It'll be good for, especially for the Western you know, scene in, in, in mobile gaming, which as you've mentioned, is, is a little bit behind when it comes to the way we approach mobile gaming and the safety that orgs have when entering it. But yeah, it's, uh, it, it's solid. Uh, speaking of which, we, we touched on it at the start before we wrap up um where game lord what happened so you you're, you're not with game lord now right you're you guys have kind of like dropped has has is random gone to ricks is that i i don't know who random I... is i've never met that player <laughs> in my life um i only know olive uh olive is currently our stand in baron laner due to leon taking uh... a bit of a step back because he is focusing on school so he's unable to play uh i did mention leon you know full time like world record deadlifts you know uh, yeah leon is is ripped as heck man that's all i'm gonna say about it that dude is flexing um just not in wild rift right now you know i mean yeah i can say that i mean i think that is a big part of kind of what i said about consistency and giving players more of an opportunity i mean i don't think necessarily think specifically for leon it's as true because he, he kind of wants to finish his schooling and then you know work on his schoolwork and that's kind of what he's doing um as opposed to you know putting all of his time into wild rift over the last few months he's been able to play less and less and less and you know at a certain point we were like you know, you're definitely the best if you're on your game. You are 100%. Like, in my mind, Leon is probably the best player in Europe if he's playing full-time and practicing full-time, but he just hasn't been able to. Um, and then, yeah, we, you know, we saw Olive smurfing on the solo queue ladder, and it just seemed like yeah, a yeah, solid opportunity yeah. cool. to be able to, you know, perhaps try another player who could potentially fill those shoes, you know, at least until... I mean, obviously, that's a conversation much further down the road of when Leon is able to play again, right? But at least until, you know, end of 2021, Leon is pretty much... You know, very very half time quarter time honestly <laughs> if i'm being completely realistic given that he's played about you know 20 you know, like less than 50 solo queue games in the past four months um so yeah i mean it, it's kind of just is one of those things that just happened to work out as a result of kind of like the european circuit coming to an end for the time being yep and yeah for for random himself i don't know honestly like you should uh should ask him himself because I, I can't speak for him. I don't know what uh, what's happening with him for sure. I've heard about Alif. He seems quite good, but yeah, maybe uh, maybe we'll see some more uh, rumors from Wild Rift Wulu coming up in the next uh, coming days. <laughs> we week. need a we need a Wild Rift Wulu. We, we have We've one. already got one. We have they one. haven't seen it. <laughs> That's the thing. We have one. Have we got a Wild Rift Wulu? Yeah, yeah, we, we have. Do. <laughs> Does he not follow you? You must not be a big deal. Don't blame yourself. <laughs> I'm not a big deal. I'm not a big yeah, deal. It's, 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 it's just because yeah, you're, you're kind of a smaller scale creator. I wouldn't take it personally. Yeah, no, I agree. I think he follows Stu though. I'm not saying that means something, but I'm just you know I'm just calling it how I see it. The, the ending note, though, is that I am way better than Stu at Wild Rift, <laughs> as proved today. Also, apparently, better than Darkbreaker, although I can't say that with confidence because Darkbreaker is absolutely better at the game than me. Uh, but definitely better <laughs> than Stu, and that's all that counts. Uh, and I think that should be the closing note on this uh, podcast. Also, <laughs> that's Ruiz a good one. Snitch. And, True. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, dear. I had fun. Guys. I had a lot of fun. There was, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I actually do need to go to bed soon because I'm waking up at six in the morning mm. to, cast some, to cast some Horizon Cup. Uh, but the Horizon Cup starts tomorrow at, I believe, 11 CET. Is 11 yep. CET, broadcast? yep. When the broadcast goes live, although I have to be up much earlier than that for rehearsals. So there you, go. <laughs> you can catch me co-streaming. I don't know if you'll be watching this before, unless you're watching it live, in which case, of course, you'll be watching it before. But assuming that, you know, it goes out on YouTube or Spotify or whatever we decide to somehow manage to work out, I assume you'll be watching this in the future. So maybe it will not be the 12th of November anymore. But if it is the 12th of November, you can catch me co-streaming the whole event tomorrow on Twitch or TV yep. slash Snitch. And I'll be doing some game analysis after that on my YouTube. So yeah, go ahead if you're interested in game knowledge and such. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's been, it's been fun. And I think Snitch, I'll be joining you for some co-streams, hopefully, on the days that oh, I'm Oh, hopefully. 
And yeah, I'll manage, I'm sure I'll manage to suction Dooms in as well, you know, if I'm Dooms can come in real and, sneaky. Uh, <laughs> I had a lot of fun, guys. This was good. And uh, and hopefully we get to do another one of these after the Horizon Cup, maybe. We could talk a little bit mm -hmm. about like what happened and what we're expecting to see next year. Mm. And hopefully mm. by the end of the Horizon Cup, we'll know what's happening next year. Because I think the uh, I'm hoping the, uh, the announcement goes out around that time towards the end of the Horizon Cup. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Spoilers. I'm not going to say anything. Before, and I think I'm going to. I think I'm going to disconnect from the call before I say anything more. <laughs> hey, Dora, I'll just, I'll just suavely cut to the intro screen. But yeah, this has been the Wild of Esports podcast, the debut episode. We kind of did a decent job, I think, keeping to a schedule and, and doing a reasonable job. So yeah, thank you guys for listening in and checking it out. And hopefully, we'll be back again soon. Thank you guys very much. Goodbye. I'm waving. They're not waving, they're waving. We're all waving. Woo! <laughs>